There's something in Alaska that has been hunting human beings for thousands of years. Today we'll be discussing the story of Alaska's murderous Bigfoot and how it cost one small town to become abandoned overnight. The Pacific Northwest is an area of North America known for its beauty and wildlife. People often find themselves drawn to places like Oregon, Washington, or Alaska in search of a home where they can find peace and be more in tune with nature. Unfortunately, sometimes they find things they couldn't have even believed existed. One small town in Alaska found itself under siege by an unknown beast in the 20th century causing residents to flee for their very lives. Many people refer to this story as the Alaskan Bigfoot, but how much of this story is based in fact, and how much of it is a dark fantasy? To better understand the mystery of Port Locke, to understand why families abandon their homes, workers abandon their livelihoods, and villagers abandon their town, we need to understand the history of the region surrounding Port Locke and the people who have inhabited that region for thousands of years, the native Alaskans. The native people of Alaska are a resilient group of survivalists. As I mentioned, they've survived there for a very long time, and it is one of the most difficult places to live on the planet. Between frigid temperatures and an abundance of large predators, these people are no stranger to being strong when situations get difficult. One such group, the Ayutique, chose to call a portion of southern Alaskan coast, including the Kenai Peninsula, their home. The Ayutik have a legend of a half-man, half-beast creature, known as the Aluak, who has haunted them for generations, sometimes represented as either a Bigfoot-like creature, being 10 to 12 feet in height, covered in dark hair with extraordinary strength, or smaller creatures that can transform into animals, hunt in packs, and move extremely quickly. The Aluak is nothing to be trifled with. Within Aleutik culture, it is taught that people who follow tracks belonging to the Aliwak often found that the tracks would suddenly disappear, leaving no trace behind. That if you get close enough to touch the Aliwak, it could vanish even as you extend your hand. Sometimes the Aliwak were considered shy and would simply steal from the Aleutik villages at night. But others were more aggressive and would attack and even hunt people. The Aliwak being used to explain the disappearance of men women and children over several lifetimes. So where does the Aluak come from? Well, the Aluatik believe that the Aluak were members of the tribe who were banished due to committing crimes and forced to live in the wilderness. Over time, these exiled people would lose their sanity and become evil spirits. These evil spirits could shapeshift and become animals or take human form to deceive tribespeople. They would not speak in their native tongue, rather they would make whistling sounds that would disorient their prey. It's important to note that the Aleutik were not alone in this belief, and other Alaskan tribes describe similar accounts. The Aleutik considered these being so dangerous that the very word Aluak means to run away. Another name provided for this Bigfoot-like creature that appears in reports by locals is Nantanak, a word from the Dena'ina people that roughly translates into a warning, those who steal us a warning that the town of Port Locke did not heed until it was too late. One of the first non-native visitations occurred in the area in 1779. The Spanish attempted to land near Port Locke with the intention of establishing a presence in the bay. However, shortly after making landfall, a mysterious illness befell the Spanish crew. Seven sailors died before the Spanish decided to abandon the area out of fright. Nearly a decade later, in 1787, Following a multi-year voyage, Nathaniel Portlock, a captain in the Royal Navy, reached the area. He sent landing parties ashore that did find an abandoned native village. The landing parties searched for signs as to why the natives had left, but none were found. No recently used fires, no food, no canoes. It is from the Nathaniel Portlock expedition that the area derives its name. That being said, the town is also referred to as Port Chatham and the names have been used interchangeably. For nearly 100 years, it appears nothing of note occurred in the area until in 1867, a San Francisco newspaper reported on a group of Altuic people that settled in the region. They found themselves under attack from the Aliwak, the Nantanak. Unwilling to surrender the land without a fight, they waged war against the creatures for years. When food would become scarce, the creatures would emerge from the woods and kidnap and devour tribespeople. The creatures were referred to in the newspaper as 
cannibalistic giants and that they would come out whenever they needed a square meal and rip people limb from limb. In the early 1900s, the town of Porlock began to draw on a consistent population based around a cannery of salmon that drove the local fishing industry. People came for work, but stayed because of the beauty of the bay and towering pines. At first glance, Porlock appeared to be a thriving and postcard-worthy small town. Things began to take a bizarre and terrifying turn in 1905, as the Aluak, or Nantanak, decided to greet its new neighbors. Workers at the local fishery abandoned the town for the first time, citing something in the woods as a reason for doing so, and did not return until the next season. Rumors began circulating in surrounding settlements that something strange was occurring in Portlock. Loggers began finding trees simply ripped from the ground with their roots intact, or the same trees removed and reinserted upside down back into the ground. Villagers were going missing. Body parts were washing up in the port to the horror of locals. In 1920, a year before the United States Postal Service founded a post office in Portlock, a man named Albert Petka had an encounter with an Antonac. He was attacked by a creature. His body was found near the town, and he appeared to have been strangled. When the body was examined, it was determined that a bear could not have been responsible. Deaths and disappearances would be a common occurrence in the area for years to come, with hunters going missing. Often, bodies would be found mutilated and shredded in such a way that wasn't consistent with any known animal attacks. The bodies would be found sporadically in creeks, trees, and other areas. In 1931, a logger by the name of Andrew Kamluck was near his logging camp outside of town limits when he was struck over the head with a large piece of log moving equipment. Although the blow most likely killed him instantly, the bizarre evidence around the murder was haunting. The item that had struck him was far too large to have been picked up by any man. Whatever killed Andrew then tossed the lock mover like a twig about 10 feet away from his body. Blood was everywhere, and there were no answers to be found. In 1943, a man named John Mayer had an encounter with the very beast causing the issues. He was attacked by a creature while accompanied by his dogs. Although he, coupled with the dogs, managed to fight the creature off, he suffered a chest injury and was on the verge of death, but was able to convey before his passing that whatever attacked him was not a bear, but a monster. In 1944, a gold miner from nearby Port Graham went out prospecting as he had many times before and just disappeared one day. A search party was sent to look for him and no evidence was found. His disappearance was attributed to the beast. Tom Larson, a local sawmill owner, had a chilling encounter with the Nantanac. He was charged with cutting wood to repair old fish traps near the beach. While walking on the beach, he saw a large creature holding a fish trap with one hand and reaching into it with the other. The creature wasn't using a paw, but a very human-like hand to reach in and grab its prize. The creature then began eating the fish raw. Hiding himself some distance away, Tom recognized the opportunity. He quickly and quietly retreated back to his home to retrieve his rifle. He made his way back to the beach and the beast was still feasting. He took aim and was about to fire when the creature suddenly turned to face him. Staring down the sights of the rifle, he was frozen. The creature was looking back at him with the piercing eyes. Piercing human-like eyes. Tom knew that this was the animal terrorizing his town. But this moment felt different. He wasn't going to be simply shooting an animal, but something that appeared to be much more than that. He slowly lowered his rifle and stepped back into the bush as the creature retreated. Tom's encounter left many more questions than answers. His account showed people that whatever was hunting them was definitely not a simple animal. As the years passed, the issue became more and more troublesome. Accounts of other encounters of the paranormal kind pushed the Brazilian townspeople towards their breaking point. Unfortunately for them, these strange encounters would continue. Inhabitants of the town reported seeing smaller creatures in the forest that hunted in packs. These creatures were covered in hair, much like the reported in Antinac, but smaller. They would chase people down and attack them, only to leave a grisly, bloody mess in their wake. Very similar to what had occurred in 1867. Villagers also reported an apparition of a woman with a pale face stalking the cliffs around the town. She dragged long, draping black clothes around with her. 
loudly wailing in the distance, but vanishing at any time anyone would get close to her. The psyche of the townspeople was never allowed a reprieve from the constant anxiety of being the prey in what had become a hunting reserve for an unknown creature or creatures. Over the course of multiple decades, it was reported that nearly 36 people were killed or went missing as a result of what was occurring in Port Locke. Beginning in 1940, the people had finally reached their breaking point and began to move to other neighboring villages. The company operating the cannery offered to have armed guards placed at the cannery to guarantee workers' safety, but it wasn't enough. The cannery burnt down twice during this time, and people reported feeling watched in the village limits. The final remaining 31 people would often hear banging on the outsides of their home walls at night. Village elders began calling for the relocation of townspeople to nearby towns. As of 1950, the only man remaining was the postmaster. He continued to stay in the town anticipating the people's return until he finally decided to leave in 1951. So the town of Portlock was left to rot. Or was it? No one has resettled Portlock, but people have returned to it. And they too have encountered the Nantanak. <laughs>